Eugene is a certified trainer for EBIS or EBOC. He does, I mean, I looked at his calendar. We couldn't get in for two months because he's got three, four trainings a month. So this is what he kind of does. He does it primarily with ambulance, MedStar, folks in Sioux Falls, and we looked at the NFPA standards and um, you know, he's going to teach it for the fire purposes here. This is the first part of a two-part certification. So attending the class tonight is the first part. The second part is we'll set up that obstacle course. We got a sign-up sheet up here it's for June 2nd. And Eugene will put the course together for us, which is by standards and practices, all the turns and everything we need to do. Where are we going to do that? Um, at the high school on the north parking lot. They said they'd let us use it there. And the second Saturday or Sunday? Saturday. So everybody that can that can get both parts in, um, they'll get the official certification for EBOC. Um, I don't know if that makes us more available for drivers if you guys get short on driver or the ambulance. I have been told with, with fire departments, I think it's everybody has to get it, but if you've got EBOC certification, it helps with your insurance. And um, But overall, it's a good thing for us to be safe, to think about some things, some folks that haven't driven big trucks or even those that have a CDL but haven't driven an emergency vehicle. Everybody kind of knows it's a different deal. So um, we're videotaping it tonight for the guys that couldn't make it so that they can watch the video back and then take the course and still get their certification. But what if you can't make that second? Yeah. Well, Eugene mentioned before and he probably regret it. He said if somebody couldn't make it on the course day. We may try to get together and come up with a date that coincides for everybody. Yeah. And we'll try to do an Makeup day is the best way to put it. Yeah. But it'd probably only be one other available day. And apologize, there's no great time of year to do this. This this first is the time. first time in spring we get it. But but thank you, Dean, for making this happen, and I'll turn it over to okay. you. So the first I don't remember. It's like 45 minutes, 50 minutes. It's just a video. Um, there's actually a company that I'm affiliated with uh, for certified emergency vehicle operation. Um, I go through a five-year rollout every five years. I got to go somewhere and become current on the data. Um, last one being in 2015, so it's only three years old. Um, but like I said, pretty much as Shane said, you know, we're all, ultimately, your safety is always priority. Always, always number one. So we'll watch the video, then I got a short PowerPoint, um, and then we'll kind of answer any questions somebody might have. So.
Volunteer Firemen's Insurance Services Incorporated and presents an overview of their training program. In addition, Easy EVOC for Fire Apparatus will focus on why emergency vehicle operators need EVOC training, the attributes of a good vehicle operator and driving system, and the legal aspects of emergency vehicle operations. We'll finish the program with emergency vehicle safe driving practices, the physical forces that affect driving, and emergency vehicle preventive maintenance. Driving a fire apparatus during an emergency response is dangerous. Effective driving under emergency conditions requires a mature person who is alert and has <coughs> safe driving habits. To help illustrate the amount of responsibility you have while driving, you must think of yourself as your number one priority. Because if you have an accident, everyone has an accident. Without you, no one gets help. Your most important responsibility as the driver, whether in your personal vehicle or the emergency vehicle, is to return home or to the station safely. The privilege of driving to an emergency with red lights and siren places more responsibility on you, the vehicle operator, not less. You are asking through your warning devices for permission from other drivers on the road to be allowed to proceed to the emergency. You do not automatically have the right of way and you cannot force it. With the added adrenaline rush, you must remain in control of the vehicle, otherwise an accident will happen. Most major accidents involving emergency vehicles occur at intersections. At intersections, vehicles usually collide broadside at their weakest and least protected area. Specific training to cross controlled and uncontrolled intersections is essential. These accidents carry not only the chance for civil actions against your organization and you personally, but also the possibility for criminal charges. Recent cases involve charges made at the misdemeanor and felony level. As the emergency vehicle operator, you cannot blame others for your decisions or errors in judgment. The responsibility of operating the vehicle safely and effectively is yours alone. The first component of the emergency vehicle driving system is the vehicle operator. Human aspects influence you and contribute to your individual driving personality. These traits include your attitude towards driving, your driving knowledge, your state of mind while driving, your judgment and the ability to make decisions, your physical ability to handle the vehicle, your experience as it applies to capability of handling the vehicle, your driving habits, and finally, your driving skills used to properly handle the vehicle. All of these human aspects can influence your driving, either negatively or positively. It is up to you and your organization to ensure that you get the proper training to develop driving habits that can make you a safe vehicle operator. The second component of the emergency vehicle driving system is the regulatory requirements for emergency vehicle operators. <coughs> Everyone can certainly learn to become safer emergency vehicle operators. Greater safety starts by acquiring the driving skills necessary to operate an emergency vehicle. Acquired abilities include demonstration of your driving ability when testing for your operator's license, complying with all state and local mandates to operate emergency vehicles, and taking a recognized emergency vehicle driver training program. Fire service driver operator requirements are also covered in NFPA standards 1002 and 1500. Young driver's experience should also be a concern. They may have passed their driving test but drivers from age 16 to 21 will have significantly less driving experience and will need adequate training prior to being assigned as driver of a fire apparatus. The department selection process will set the tone for the professionalism expected of those chosen for the task. It is your organization's responsibility to keep track of your acquired abilities, as well as any traffic violations, through personnel files and training records. This documentation is becoming more common in today's world of civil and legal responsibility. The third and final component of the driving system is the vehicle characteristics which impact your driving abilities. The type of fire apparatus that you drive has an important influence on your driving. Each vehicle has characteristics such as turn radius, weight, center of gravity, and vehicle size that will influence your driving techniques. It's important that you train on each vehicle that you are expected to operate. It is also important that you know your vehicle's mechanical components. These include the engine, drivetrain, and braking system, all of which must be properly maintained and operated in order to ensure safe vehicle performance. Another vehicle characteristic
futuristic influence. It's the specialized training required for the safe operation of your fire apparatus. These training sessions will demonstrate the safe utilization of the vehicle. They will also demonstrate any of the vehicle's limitations. Emergency vehicle operators must realize that they cannot operate emergency vehicles as they would their personal vehicle. It is important to realize here that operating an emergency vehicle outside the recommendations of the manufacturer should never be attempted. Doing so can be dangerous to you, your crew, and the public. As an emergency vehicle operator, you must be well schooled in the laws and legal requirements under which you are allowed to operate and will be held accountable. <coughs> in the past, fire departments were largely held to be immune from civil legal action. The threat of a lawsuit is larger today than ever. Individual vehicle operators are being held accountable for their negligent actions. Negligence is a very important term. In proper legal terms, negligence is defined as the omission to do something which a reasonable person, guided by those ordinary considerations which ordinarily regulate human affairs, would do, or the doing of something which a reasonable and prudent person would not do. It is the most common legal approach used to sue emergency vehicle operators. It refers to a legal deficiency resulting from the unsafe operation of an emergency vehicle, no matter how slight the negligence. As a member of an emergency service organization, you are required to render all aspects of your services in a reasonable and prudent manner. If you are negligent in your driving, whether non-emergency or emergency, and there has been injury or damage to others, then you and your organization may be responsible for making the injured party whole. Your organization has a responsibility to increase the efficiency of its personnel. It must also strive to be an effective organization, reducing the threat of loss through pre-planning, resource management, education, and training. As an emergency vehicle operator, you may be required to adhere to three types of regulations. These include all motor vehicle and traffic laws and regulations, local ordinances, and your agency's operational policies and procedures. Your organization should have written standard operating guidelines that meet the standard of NFPA 1500. In most localities, there are three principles of emergency vehicle operation under the law. You are subject to all traffic laws and regulations unless specifically exempted. Exemptions are allowed only under emergency response situations, and you are still held accountable for your driving, both criminally and civilly, if involved in an accident, even with the exemptions applied. When dealing with traffic laws exempting emergency vehicle operators, remember that an interpretation of emergency can at times be very vague. Often, what is considered a true emergency, and thus what entitles you to drive with exemptions, is settled in court after an accident has occurred. Is the call that you are responding to a true emergency worth the risks being taken by responding with lights and siren? Another legal aspect for emergency vehicle operators is the term due regard. Due regard has to do with the actions you take while responding to an emergency and how you consider the safety of the public and yourself. Legally, due regard is defined as a reasonably careful person performing the similar duties and under similar circumstances would act in the same manner. Was enough warning given by your emergency signals before collision? The courts will usually consider whether it was appropriate to use emergency signals when responding. If the signals were used, were they audible and visible to the public? You should always use caution when driving with lights and siren, and use due regard for the safety of yourself and others. We've considered the components of an emergency driving system and the legal aspects of emergency vehicle operations. Now let's talk about safe emergency vehicle driving practices. When the alarm sounds and you are dispatched to an emergency, a lot of things quickly run through your mind. As you approach your vehicle, check all sides for obstructions and open compartment doors. Make sure the crew dons all protective clothing prior to stepping on the rig. This will prevent them from 
unbuckling their seatbelts while en route to adjust their gear. When you get behind the wheel, fasten your seatbelt, make any adjustments to the mirrors, look again for obstructions, and check to see that other crew members are properly seated with seatbelts fastened. Seatbelts are important to emergency vehicle operators and occupants. There are many myths circulating as to the benefit or hazards of seatbelts. What we cannot dispute are the facts. Seatbelts save lives and reduce injury. Seatbelts also keep you behind the wheel of your vehicle and in control if there is a collision. It is also important to remember that the occupants of your vehicle should be wearing seatbelts at all times while the vehicle is in motion. good common sense and safer. It's mandated by federal and state regulations. National standards such as NFPA 1500 also address the necessity of occupant restraints. Your department should have a written policy requiring the use of seatbelts by all occupants of an emergency vehicle at all times. It is important that you take a pre-planned approach to your response. Think about the best routes to the location of the emergency. You may need to quickly locate the incident on your map to refresh your memory. Consider traffic conditions at the time of the call. What are the weather conditions and how will they influence your driving? Now, begin your response. Physical laws of nature come into play as the vehicle accelerates. It is important that you know how to anticipate and handle these forces. When you step on the accelerator and the unit accelerates, physical forces immediately start to affect your vehicle. These forces include velocity, friction, inertia, momentum, and centrifugal force. The basis for safe emergency vehicle operations is understanding how to control your vehicle, anticipating the actions of other drivers, the reaction of your vehicle, and avoiding loss of control are all important parts of safe emergency vehicle operations. The first form of control you have over your vehicle is velocity. As your vehicle accelerates, keep in mind that you are increasing its velocity. Increasing velocity lengthens the vehicle's braking distance. By slowing the speed, you shorten the braking distance. Remember that fire and rescue units are heavier than passenger vehicles. The greater weight affects the velocity of the vehicle differently. Another form of control you have over your vehicle is direction. You can steer to maneuver safely through an intersection or in traffic as long as your tires keep contact with the road surface. Once the tires lose contact with the road surface, you lose control of vehicle direction. Velocity and direction are important to your driving because they are forces that you can directly control. As you drive on the roadway, the friction of the tires against the roadbed creates resistance, allowing the vehicle to move forward. This is one way that friction affects your control of the vehicle. The friction will vary with different road surfaces, giving you more or less control of your vehicle. In wet conditions, the tires may hydroplane, causing the tires to lose their grip on the road surface, thus causing you to lose control of the vehicle. Friction also plays a part in stopping the vehicle. Brake shoes on drum-type brakes and brake pads on disc brake systems press against a steel surface, creating friction and causing the vehicle to slow down. When the brakes are in poor condition or become overheated, they become inefficient and may fade or fail altogether. Proper and regular vehicle maintenance will help to prevent poor brake condition. Inertia is the physical law that states an object continues in a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. Things that are stationary tend to stay that way, and things that are moving tend to keep moving until an outside force affects them. Applied to auto accidents, the irresistible force meets the immovable object, and a collision occurs, causing substantial damage at the point of impact. The proper way to get the most braking from your brake system is to apply the brakes early and come to a slow stop. However, if a sudden hazard presents itself, you can also get quick performance by applying the brakes until just before they start to lock up. Remember, if you lock the brakes, the vehicle's wheels lose their grip on the road, causing you to lose control. This brings us to another point about control. 
In order for you to control the direction of your apparatus, tires must have good friction or grip on the road surface, and they must be rotating. If the front wheels lock up during a sudden stop, you will lose control of the vehicle. You will only regain control after the wheels are rotating again. Some fire service vehicles may be equipped with anti-lock braking systems. These braking systems automatically adjust the brake application between all four wheels, greatly reducing the tendency for the brakes to lock up during a sudden stop. Some large fire apparatus will also be equipped with an engine braking system to assist in slowing these heavier vehicles. You should be familiar with proper application of these braking systems according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Be aware that though they greatly enhance your safety, anti-lock braking systems may not always perform as expected. When your vehicle is moving, it is also acted upon by its momentum. Heavier vehicles, such as fire apparatus, have more momentum than do lighter vehicles. The forces needed to stop larger vehicles will be greater than those needed to stop smaller vehicles. Therefore, the stopping distance will be longer for fire apparatus than for a passenger car. It is also important to consider momentum when we look at the collisions between fire apparatus and passenger cars. Because they are larger and heavier, fire apparatus can inflict heavier damage and more severe bodily harm to a passenger car and its occupants. When your fire apparatus comes upon a turn or curve in the road, you should begin braking and downshifting. At this time, additional forces will begin acting on the fire apparatus. As the vehicle enters the turn, Centrifugal force begins to pull you to the outside of the turn. This force causes an object to fly out from a curved path. The vehicle naturally tries to maintain a straight line as you guide it into the turn. The greater the velocity into the turn, or the sharper the turn, the greater the centrifugal force. If you turn too quickly or too sharply, the centrifugal force will be too strong to maintain proper control of the vehicle. In addition, if the wheels lock up when attempting to make the turn, the vehicle will lose its grip or friction with the road surface. Inertia will then cause the vehicle to travel in a straight line until the wheels are allowed to rotate and create needed friction. Centrifugal force will also be greater on heavier vehicles. For example, a 3,000 pound car entering a 500 foot radius curve at 60 miles an hour will have a centrifugal force of 1,400 pounds acting on it. A fire apparatus weighing 30,000 pounds at the same speed will have 14,400 pounds of centrifugal force acting upon it. Following other vehicles present another set of hazards <coughs> for the emergency vehicle driver. A safe following distance, safe stopping distances, techniques to estimate safe following distances, and circumstances which dictate increasing your following distance are all important factors for us to consider. A safe following distance will allow you to stop or avoid a collision with the vehicle in front of you. Stopping distance is the sum of your reaction time plus the braking distance of your vehicle. The reaction time for most vehicle operators averages about three quarters of a second. Greater speed will increase the distance traveled during that reaction time. To calculate feet per second, it's easiest to multiply miles per hour by 1.5. When traveling at 40 miles an hour, your vehicle is traveling at 60 feet per second. Your reaction time of three quarters of a second would allow your vehicle to travel another 45 feet before your braking action begins. The braking distance starts with the application of the braking system and is completed when the vehicle comes to a complete stop. Greater speed and greater vehicle weight will increase the stopping distance of the vehicle. At intersections or unsafe areas, Simply taking your foot off the accelerator and placing it over the brake pedal will help to shorten your reaction time for braking. A safe following distance will allow for more reaction time and greater stopping distance. The four second rule is the best method for estimating a safe following distance. Stay at least four seconds behind the vehicle in front of you. You can do this by picking out a pole or sign that the vehicle ahead passes, then count 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004. If you pass the pole before 1004, you need to slow your speed to maintain a safe following distance. The following distance should also be increased during emergency responses for a number of reasons. The effects of stress upon you while you're driving. 
the unpredictable reactions of motorists as you approach them, and the better view ahead that a greater following distance allows. Emergency vehicle operators responding with lights and siren should add a fifth second to this formula for even greater safety. On poor roads, during bad weather, at night, or when your line of sight is impaired, you should double your safe following distance. On icy or packed snow-covered roads, it is prudent to at least triple the following distance for safety. A large number of accidents involving emergency vehicles occur while the unit is backing. Nearly all backing collisions can be avoided by following the policy of never backing a unit without a spotter at the rear. The person acting as the spotter should always be in full view of the driver and never turn his or her back to the unit. Better yet, avoid unnecessary backing when possible by simply driving around the block. Another good way to help avoid minor collisions involves considering vehicle safety and fire station design. Drive-through vehicle bays greatly reduce the need for backing the unit. In addition, adequately sized bay doors will help prevent incidents where the vehicle compartment doors come into contact with the building. We'll complete this program with proper emergency vehicle maintenance, for which you as the operator may be responsible. An established preventive maintenance program will cover several general objectives. These include inventorying equipment and supplies on a regular basis, Familiarization of the crew with the vehicle and its equipment during each vehicle inspection. Noting discrepancies in equipment and supplies for repair or replacement. Keeping the history of the vehicle's maintenance and service current. And keeping the vehicle in a state of readiness at all times. By performing a routine inspection and maintenance check on each emergency vehicle, your organization will be assured that their equipment and emergency vehicles are in the best possible condition to respond to and handle the emergencies that arise. Routine inspections and maintenance procedures are also required by NFPA Standard 1500 and 1002. We encourage you to become familiar with these two standards. Responding in emergency vehicles is necessary, but it can be dangerous for responders and the public. During this program, we discuss the need for emergency vehicle operator training and the attributes of a good vehicle operator and driving system. Emergency vehicle safe driving practices, legal aspects, physical forces affecting the vehicle, and finally emergency vehicle preventive maintenance were also covered. Viewing one video program or attending one class will not make you a good emergency vehicle operator. As with most emergency responder skills, driving takes practice and maturity. You must always keep in mind that you are not exempt from any driving regulations while responding to an emergency scene. You are relying on the goodwill and responsiveness <coughs> of the general driving public to let you pass around them safely. The consequences of unsafe driving can never be matched by the emergency in which you're responding. It is now up to you to practice the techniques we've demonstrated. Safe driving begins with training, continues with experience, and produces a professional emergency vehicle operator. Drive safely. Okay, this is just going to be a pretty much quick recap. We're going to have to get a little more into detail. Uh, like I said, just take care of the classroom portion tonight, or if you watch video. Um, and then June 2nd, we'll meet up at the high school on your time slots. Uh, we're going to schedule two people for 30 minutes is kind of our intentions um, and then try to get wheel behind the wheel time to everybody that's there the backing the curves and the stop and distance thing so um, ultimately safety goals we got to have safety goals um, and like I said biggest one is we want to diminish that risk factor of having an accident that is our huge factor because you guys wreck a truck for starters, all of a sudden now you lose a piece of your equipment. You know, worst case scenario, somebody gets hurt. The ultimate thing, somebody dies. Okay, so we just want to try to get that risk factor away that we're eliminating that chance of, of being involved in an accident. As we said, personal safety, your safety, your partner's safety, and the community safety is all there. And then ultimately. If you drive the trucks aggressively and you're putting the brakes on it, your expenditure for maintenance and upkeep is going to go up. Okay? So 
So ultimately, that's kind of it. Keep in mind, when we're operating emergency vehicles, we got to try to stay in accordance with multiple agencies, government rules, regulations, state rules and regulations, um, local, and then within the fire department. So you need to try to put all of those regulations together and operate safely, okay? So again, you gotta kind of mesh all of the four of those and then making sure that you're meeting federal requirements, state, local, and then your organizational or department. Certain actions are dangerous. What kind of things do we do driving our personal vehicles that put us at risk of being in an accident? Gawk eat. What's that? Gawk and eat. Gawk eat on the phone. Speed. On the phone. Speed. Okay. Taking anything that distracts us from our job. Theoretically, our job should be we're operating a vehicle. <coughs> Somebody else needs to be helping us clear the intersection. Somebody else should be talking on the radio. All of that stuff. That shouldn't be the driver doing it. So again, talking to passengers, talking to your coworkers, things like that. Adjusting the radios, adjusting your climate. I mean, just taking your quick second to look, do I have the right knob? Is putting you at risk. Eating, snacking, okay? And then using cell phones. That's our biggest kicker right now, is cell phone usage within the United States and stuff. So again, whose safety is priority? We kind of beat this to a pulp, I hope. You're always number one. You are the first thing that you need to keep in mind. Started my shift, I want to go home at the end of my shift. Okay? Um, then my partner or partners, depending on how many people are in the truck with you, their safety needs to be within your limitations. Um, and lastly, of course, the community. Okay? Kind of gets that bad image when Sioux Falls Fire, Del Rapids Fire is involved in an accident, somebody's killed. You kind of get that black check mark after your organization, okay? So you are always, always number one. You can never forget that, okay? I mean, it's number 